Last week we had the privilege of um, Dr. Luke Standard among us, um, the senior pastor of MICC, and today we have um, another pastor from MICC preaching among us today, Pastor Arim Chua. Please welcome with me, Pastor Arim Chua. Thank you, Father, and IVC for the warm welcome. It's an amazing thing for me to come to a new church as a complete stranger and not fear that you guys are going to eat me up because, right, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and I can feel that in your beautiful faces. Thank you for the warm welcome. My name is Harim, and I'm a pastoral intern at MICC. And and it's really an honor and a blessing to be here and to be able to share God's word with you this morning. The sermon text on this Christmas Eve Sunday is found in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. So please turn with me to Isaiah 42. We remember Christ in a special way, right? in this Christmas season. He came to this earth to give his life as a ransom for many. So please stand in honor of the reading of the word of God from Isaiah 42 verses one through four. Let us pay close attention to the holy word of God. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for giving us the Bible, which is your inspired word written down for our benefit that is able to make us wise for salvation by faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord, your Son. I pray that you would speak to us through your living and active word this morning, that you would empower me by your spirit to proclaim your word clearly and effectively, that you would open our ears and our hearts to receive your word of Christ humbly, desperately, that we might grow in the knowledge of you and love you more and more and worship you appropriately. Would you do this, that you may be glorified in Christ and in the church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Have you ever really, really waited for something? You know, sometimes we wait a long time looking forward to something good that we like. In high school, I used to say that I've been waiting for Friday since Saturday. Maybe you love Christmas and you've been waiting for this season the whole year. Maybe it's something more abstract like world peace. And if we look at the world, it feels like more and more people are waiting for some political hero to arise to bring about their ideal of justice, peace. And there might have been someone in Isaiah's time who was also waiting for a new king to bring about justice and peace. 
the prophet Isaiah lived in the context of chaotic violence in world politics and in the context of hopeless disintegration of the people of God. The book of Isaiah was written at a point uh, in Israel's history marked by dramatic failure after failure. See, over decades and decades, they rebelled and sinned against God despite God having warned them over and over again. Over, but so by this point, over 30 kings came and went. There were like only four good kings among them. And Isaiah is seeing in real time the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel by the nation of Assyria. And God spared the southern kingdom of Judah this time around, as we read in Isaiah 37. But it's only a matter of time for them too, because in just a generation or two, Babylon will come and destroy them and take them all into exile. So the people of God are caught in sin. The violence of the nations are raging. In the midst of this total chaos, the average Jewish person might have felt really discouraged. Waiting and waiting for someone to come and deliver them from this hopeless situation. And it might come to us as a surprise that in our text today, God has chosen a servant to deliver his people from sin and suffering. Something that no king in Israel or Judah or any nation could accomplish, this chosen servant of God can and will accomplish through humble obedience to the will of God. And God wants us to be in awe of this servant and worship him. So the message of our text today can be summarized like this. Worship God's chosen, gentle, and faithful servant, the Savior of the world. Worship God's chosen, gentle, and faithful servant, the Savior of the world. We will look at this text in three parts. First, verse 1 speaks of the servant as God's chosen servant. Second, verses 2 and 3 speak of the servant as the gentle servant. And third, Verse 4 speaks of the servant as the faithful servant. And throughout the passage, we will learn that the servant is truly the savior of the world. Let us now turn to verse 1 and see the chosen servant of God. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. If you read the rest of the book of Isaiah, you will see that there are other servants that are mentioned. Most clearly, Israel is said to be God's servant. For example, in chapter 44, verse 1, it says, But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. The Bible in other places talks about people like Adam and David as servants of God. So what does it mean to be a servant of God? If you look at this verse, this verse suggests that the meaning of being a servant is closely related to the meaning of being chosen. Notice how verse 1 has this parallel structure. My servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. My servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. So how this verse is written 
in itself shows that servant and chosen are related ideas and upholding and delighting are related ideas. And throughout scripture, a big part of being a servant of God and being chosen by God has to do with having a mission. And that mission is usually to represent God in this world by doing the will of God. For example, Israel. Israel's mission was to represent God among the other nations by obeying God's law and leading them to God with humility and compassion. And David's mission was to rule over God's people with the kind of purity and strength and righteousness that reflects God's rule over his kingdom. And the interesting thing about these other servants is that they all failed. The book of Isaiah starts by talking about the sin and rebellion and failure of the Israelites. And we know that other servants like Adam and David also sinned. None of these people were perfect servants who represented God and did his will perfectly. And these imperfect servants who failed point us to the perfect servant here in Isaiah 42. The whole world is suffering from an insurmountable problem of evil and injustice, and we really don't need another servant who will fail. We need the perfect servant who will not fail. And that servant is Jesus. We see the New Testament confirming that this perfect servant, this chosen servant in Isaiah 42 is indeed Jesus, as we see in Matthew 12, verse 14. But the Pharisees, they were annoyed by what, they were, what Jesus was doing, and they went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many, 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 followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, Behold my servant whom I have chosen. Jesus, whom we remember in this very special way on this special Christmas Eve Sunday service, is God's chosen perfect servant. And we see that God loves Jesus, his chosen servant. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. Why is it that God loves a servant in this special way in upholding and delighting in him? Because this servant, is the one and only perfect servant who knows God and who knows his will, who, who loves God and loves his will, and who will never sin or rebel against the Father. This isn't just some random servant, one of, among uh, many. This is God's perfect chosen servant who will not do his own will, not boast in his own strength, not go astray in his own ways, but the perfect servant who surely and perfectly obeys God to the end. This servant is Jesus, the beloved one of God, the son of God. Let us continue reading and see how special this servant really is. I have put my spirit upon him, second half of verse 1. 
He will bring forth justice to the nations. Here we are told what the mission of this chosen servant is, which is to bring forth justice to the nations. What does God mean by bringing forth justice to the nations? Because it's important for us to understand because the same concept is repeated two more times in verses 3 and 4. And so what does, what does this justice mean? It might mean maybe fairness to us in the sense that if you get two candies for Christmas, I should also get two candies for Christmas. But it feels like, right, the sense of this word here goes much deeper and shows that God wants perfect justice, true justice, that everything wrong gets fixed, that suffering people are rescued from oppressors, that systems and cultures of injustice are uprooted, that there is the restoration of perfect righteousness and joy and peace in this broken, sin-stricken world. Have you ever been unjustly treated? You know, like racism at the airport? And it's just so frustrating and hurtful when things like that happen. Or for my young friends who are sitting here so politely and so well during the sermon, my friends were under 18 and were still at school. Have you ever had a moment when something happened and you just thought it was so unfair, but you couldn't tell your teacher about it because he or she wouldn't believe you or wouldn't care? Or maybe you didn't want to tell anyone because it's actually a bully problem. And you were afraid that even the teachers couldn't really do anything about it. Well, Jesus is not like the teacher who doesn't know or who doesn't care or who can't do anything about injustice. Jesus cares about the problem of injustice in this world and has come, and in fact will come again, to fix it. Ultimately, when Jesus comes back one day, he will fulfill this great mission of bringing total justice. No more suffering, no more pain, no more racism, no more bullies. Bringing forth perfect, true justice may sound like an impossible mission, but Jesus is God's chosen servant, and he will do it. But is God's perfect justice really good news for us? If God were to be perfectly just, he would need to judge all sins and condemn all sinners. That's bad news for us, right? Because who will be able to survive God's bringing forth justice in the world? How can any of us escape God's just condemnation? I mean, we've all sinned, you and I, and fall terribly short of the glory of God. And I think the answer is hinted at in this verse that we just read and explained later in verses 2 through 4, but let's first look at verse 1. God says, I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. See, throughout Isaiah, God has been talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in empowering 
and confirming the coming Messiah, the promised Savior of the world. And this verse points us to what happened at Jesus' baptism when the Spirit came down like a dove. And like in that text here, we see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit present. This amazing little verse. And here also the Father loves the Son and has put his Spirit upon him. So this, this servant is the Spirit-filled Messiah, the long-awaited Savior of the world. No king of the ancient world, no modern politician or teacher of this world can eradicate racism and bullying and establish true justice because the very heart of every person is evil. Of course, it's very good and smart that we put into practice some wise measures of punishing and preventing evil, but it is impossible to establish true justice by any human effort or any human means because at the heart of it all, in our own hearts, lies death causing sin. In order to establish true and lasting justice, the human heart has to be transformed. And only the chosen servant king, Jesus, can accomplish this spiritual task of delivering fallen, sinful humanity by the power of the Spirit, teaching spiritual truth with spiritual authority and ultimately dying a sacrificial death on the cross. This is who Jesus is, the chosen servant, the Savior of the world. We now come to point two of the sermon. Jesus is the gentle servant. Verses two and three reveal to us how Jesus is going to save the world. And Jesus is the gentle servant, we read, who saves through gentleness and humble self-sacrifice. Let us first read verse two. Verse 2 says, He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. Um, one of the common tactics, tactics of this world of, um, or to bring about change is to have a loud voice and flashly advertisements. No, but when, when Jesus came into this world, he did not come loud and flashly like, like a politician maybe who advertises himself with posters and rallies and megaphones. He came quietly and humbly, as you heard earlier today, as a baby in a manger. My wife and I, we just got our first daughter. She's just two months old. And it is unbelievable that Jesus came as a little baby, that he was at one point in his life two months old. He came humbly, not considering equality with God, something to be grasped, right? We read in Philippians that he emptied himself and put on the form of a, servant being born in the likeness of men. And his surprising tactic for his mission of justice in this world was to not sit in the White House or some other parliament in this world's governments, 
but to heal the sick, to care for the weak, to teach God's truths, and ultimately, shockingly, to give himself up to die on the cross. That's what we learn in the next verse. Verse 3, of bruised reed he will not break, and of faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. When the loud and flashy tactics of this world don't work, people might turn to violent and aggressive methods to accomplish whatever they want to accomplish. But Jesus didn't come like the rulers of this world to oppress and take advantage of the weak. Instead, Jesus is so gentle. We read that a bruised reed he will not break. He's so compassionate that a faintly burning wick he will not quench. And what do these images mean? A bruised reed is an almost broken plant. A faintly burning wick is a candle that's just about to go out. And both are pictures of our weakness and suffering in a fallen world. So let me ask you, have you ever felt like that? Like a bruised reed a kind of like a dying brown bent over plant or a candle that's flickering in the wind or it's just burnt too long it's kind of dying out looking back to how this past year went there might be several things that come to your mind that were just so hard maybe you're fighting depression or loneliness in a foreign country. Or looking forward to the coming year, there might be things that you are already dreading. Maybe you are diagnosed with a condition that's very difficult to treat. And you just don't know what the future really holds. Or maybe you feel like a bruise read this, uh, this, this morning for reasons that you can't even talk about. Maybe something physical, maybe something spiritual because ultimately these are pictures of the discouragement and sadness and the weariness that we feel in our own sin have you ever felt like a bruised reed or a faintly burning wick in that sense in the sense of I know the good that I want to do, but I don't do it. I know the sinful thing, the bad thing that I shouldn't do, that I don't want to do, but then I do it. What's going on with me? Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this own, my own awful sinfulness? Have you ever felt bruised and faint like that because of your own sin? Who will rescue me from all my sin? And if you have read the wonderful book of Romans, you know that the New Testament answers, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, he lived a sinless life that we could never live. And he performed many miracles, confirming that he was a promised Messiah by the power of the Holy Spirit. He taught thousands about the law of saving grace received through faith in him and he died on the cross on our behalf bearing our sin and paying the penalty that was our punishment friends that is what we remember 
in this Christmas season. We remember that the reason why bruised reeds like us are not crushed is because Jesus was crushed for us. As it says later in Isaiah, he was pierced for his transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. We are, who are in Christ do not fear God's justice because Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. And friends, Jesus is so gentle toward all who recognize their sinfulness and need for a Savior. He will give rest to all who humbly and desperately come to him for salvation. Is your heart broken and are you heavy laden because of your sin? Then come, come in your weakness to the gentle servant, Jesus. Rely on him for rest and restoration. This is Jesus, God's gentle servant, the Savior of the world. Now come to our third point, that Jesus is the faithful servant, the Savior of the world. The remaining verses emphasize how Jesus is certainly, surely, going to accomplish his mission of justice and salvation for sinners. Let's read from the end of verse 3. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his law. The word faithfully in verse 3 can mean uh, reliably, surely, or certainly. And this points Back to how Jesus is the chosen servant of God, the perfect servant who will, tr- who will bring true justice to the nations, who will certainly not fail. And verse 4 is a further explanation of the fact that Jesus will not fail in this mission. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. Notice how growing faint is related to a faintly burning wick from verse 3. And you may also have a footnote in your Bible for the word discouraged, where it says the, the word discouraged could be translated bruised. And notice how that is related to the bruised reed in verse 3. The point made here so beautifully, poetically, is that Jesus is not going to be a bruised reed or a faintly burning wick like us. Jesus is not just a nice friend who at the end of the day has the same problems that we do. We might, and we do, grow weak and be discouraged looking at the terrible brokenness in this world and within us, but Jesus doesn't. Why? Because he can and will do something about it. This points to Jesus' determined obedience to God, even to the point of death, even to death on the cross where God's justice was satisfied. And it points further to his victorious resurrection on the third day. And it points further to his glorious future return when he will ultimately fulfill everything and establish everlasting, perfect, true justice and make our salvation complete. Nothing can stop our servant, king, savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? He is never going to give up. He is never going to fail. He is the sovereign, almighty God who has all the power to fix the problem of evil and sin and injustice. And he is the one who will never fail in his mission, the faithful servant of God, the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. That's how our text ends. With a strange phrase 
and the coastlands wait for his law. The word coastlands is really, really being used as a synonym for the nations in verse 1 or the earth in verse 4. Because if you think about the geography of Israel, right? The far away places from their perspective looking this way are the islands and the coastlands of the Mediterranean. And that's why it is used as a as an expression to refer to distant places throughout Isaiah, like in chapter 49, listen to me, O coastlands, give attention, you peoples from afar. So this verse is saying, people from far away places, or people from all around the world, wait for his law. And what does it mean to wait for the servant's law? Well, we know that the whole world has been caught under the law of sin and death. And also under the law of works that leads to self-righteousness and does not lead to life. And this verse teaches us that the only hope of the whole world has always been found in the law of Christ, which is the law of saving grace received by faith in Christ alone. The law of the spirit of life that sets us free in Christ. And this has actually been a theme throughout the entire book of Isaiah. Already in the very beginning of the, in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 2, God had promised that all the nations would come to him on his holy mountain. And over and over again in Isaiah, in between the proclamation of God's like just a wrath against nations, God promises salvation for people people from every nation who would come and learn from the coming Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now take a moment to look around you. And I mean like actually look around you. Look at the person in front of you, behind you, on your left, on your right. Come on church, you can do it. Look at one another across the room like would you say that Jesus really is the Savior of the world? A church like IBC is living proof that Jesus is truly the Savior of all people from all nations and tribes and languages, from Korea, from Ghana, from Kenya, from India, from Australia, from Argentina, from Brazil, everywhere. Hallelujah. Amen. Everything about this text points to the fact that Jesus is God's chosen, gentle, and faithful servant who is the Savior of the world. This long-awaited servant came 2,000 years ago, and he dealt with the problem of sin through his sacrificial atoning death on the cross. And one day he will return to truly and fully bring perfect justice forever and ever. That is good news. That is the gospel. And all this brings us back to verse 1, and I will end with this exhortation. In verse 1, God says to us, Behold my servant. Behold, my servant. Christmas is all about beholding Christ. The Christian life is about beholding Christ. Behold means to, to look, to take notice, to ponder, to meditate upon a magnificent, supreme, beautiful truth it means 
to see Jesus for who he is and what he says, what he teaches, what he has done, and what he will do. It means to, to, to grow in our knowledge of him and to learn to worship him, to learn to love him more and more. So here is the exhortation from this text for us on this Christmas Eve. Behold Jesus, God's chosen, gentle, and faithful servant who is the Savior of the world. Brothers and sisters, let us worship our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us behold him here in the words of Isaiah 42. Behold him in deep appreciation of his first coming and in eager expectation of his return. Behold him together with one another today after their service, during their fellowship meal. Behold him this evening as you spend time with family and friends. Behold him in this coming year by committing to spending more time with him. Let us worship Jesus, God's chosen, gentle, and faithful servant, the Savior of the world. Let us pray. Father, you are glorious beyond measure, infinitely beautiful, magnificent. And we are in awe of your son, your servant, whom you have sent, who is your chosen one, gentle toward us and faithful in accomplishing his mission to establish justice and save us. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and I pray that you will work in our hearts through your Spirit to grow our love for him and allow us, even now as we sing, to worship you appro appropriately with uh, awe and trembling in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.